So thank you very much for the opportunity to, to speak. <clears throat> I also am a neurosurgeon and hope not to be an asshole. Um, <laughs> that was fantastic, by the way. We've, we've, um, we've never met before. I, I feel tremendously passionately about doing the right thing for patients. And many times in neurosurgery, and probably in what you do, and I hope in what you do as neurologists or whatever, Oftentimes, doing the right thing is doing nothing, and that's okay. We are perversely incentivized in medicine to do stuff to people because we can, and that's not acceptable. And every day you should look inside yourself and say, should I be doing this? Is this the right thing? And I'll just, as a quick aside, I'll, an example of this is <clears throat> a few years ago at the AANS CNS talking about management of vestibular schwannomas, and a survey was done live with the audience. And neurosurgeons were shown a small acoustic in a young person, and all of them said, let's operate. And they changed the question and said, what if this is in your head? And then all of them said, don't operate. Okay, so don't be disingenuous in what you do, and never offer treatment to folks that you wouldn't have done yourself. Okay? So I echo the previous speakers in indicating that these are rare um, vascular abnormalities, and they're very challenging. Okay? There is no one right way. And I can't emphasize enough as well that this has to be a team approach. You have to have experts in multiple fields who are willing to weigh in. I have no disclosures. I'm not going to go into much more introduction because it's been very, um, very nicely laid out. <clears throat> These high-grade AVMs are very challenging because of complex angio architecture. You've seen a number of angios here. <clears throat> Most of them have very large volumes. By definition, they're essentially all in highly functional areas. So they are very difficult to successfully manage with, with any one technique, whether that be surgery, um, endovascular techniques, or radiosurgery. Aruba has been mentioned. I won't go into great detail. Um, I think the, the biggest challenge um, from our perspective in thinking about uh, Aruba is that is, is short follow-up with this and looking at where these curves cross in terms of morbidity. Um, for treatment and morbidity from the disease. And some people certainly make a case to treat um, uh, unruptured AVMs in young people where uh, the procedural risk decrease over time versus the natural history. The goal of treatment is obviously in general to obliterate the hemorrhage risk, and there is no consensus. Anyone tells you that, that you know, they dogmatically know how to manage these, <clears throat> um, I think you shouldn't listen to them. And we've already mentioned there's a general tendency towards a conservative uh, management. Um, and I think that that's totally reasonable. So what do we know are the current roles for radiosurgery? And, and if you're not familiar with radiosurgery, radiosurgery is, a, is a, basically a focused radiation technique where you're able to uh, treat a, a tumor, a vascular structure, a functional target um, with high conformality, with uh, high dose fall off, so you're not exposing large areas of the brain to high doses of radiation. At my institution, most radiosurgery for vascular structures or vascular pathology is done with the gamma knife device, but there are certainly other devices, uh, linear accelerators and such, so uh, where I have gamma knife, you can substitute any device you wish. In general, it's for small to medium AVMs, uh, residual AVMs after prior management where the patient's not a good candidate for additional surgical treatments, uh, often when surgical risks are too high in critical locations. And then some of the questions become, <clears throat> you know, what do you do with these, these deep AVMs? And that's in part what we're talking about today, deep AVMs without good surgical options. And for select, again, select larger lesions, symptomatic AVMs, and when there's no other option in these cases. So I think this is a very important statement if you're going to understand um, how radiosurgery works. And it, it um, plays a role in all the things we treat, tumors, vascular malformations, functional targets. Obliteration response of an AVM depends on the radiation dose and volume. For larger volumes, the dose has to be reduced <clears throat> to decrease the risk of a radiation injury to the brain tissue. There's a dose-volume relationship with everything we do. And this is predicted um, in, in um, you know, evaluations and studies of this problem. If you look at this, you, you predict that, that the higher the dose, um, the, the higher the rate of obliteration. And then basically, if you get down to some doses, 16 gray and below, there's almost no role for treating AVMs in this fashion because the obliteration rates, at least in single session and such, are, are not high enough. And in our series in Pittsburgh, we've treated uh, you know, upwards of 1,000 or more. If you look um, at a, a dose obliteration you know, um, 
Kaplan-Meier curves, you can see with lower doses, the rate of obliteration is much less. <clears throat> now with volume, the same type of thing. We know when we have a small volume, we can give a higher dose and in a safer way. And when you have a small AVM, uh, you can treat uh, with a high dose and you obliterate those at a very nice rate with low risks of complications. But the bigger the AVM, the harder it is to obliterate the AVM with radiosurgery because you have to lower the dose. <clears throat> so radiosurgery uh, essentially started out as a single session technique and it's evolved now with newer devices like the Gamma Knife Icon and linear accelerator devices to be able to dose stage things. Radiation oncologists might call that fractionation. Um, but in general, radiosurgery for tumors and other things has been done within a single session approach. And uh, a couple of large studies, retrospective you know, uh, cohort studies and such have looked at single session management of high grade AVMs. And you know, one of the challenges here, and, and I was asked to talk about standalone. Well, I'm not sure standalone makes much sense, so we're going to just get away from standalone. Um, and you, you'll see that most of these patients have had attempted surgery, they've had attempted embolization, these kinds of things. And when you do single session radiosurgery for these high grade, very complex um, arteriovenous malformations, a favorable outcome, which is a combination of uh, lack of a radiation effect, complete obliteration with no permanent neurological uh, deficits and no hemorrhage, only happens in about 26% of patients. Okay. Actuarial obliteration, only 42% at 12 years. There's a, still a 3% risk of hemorrhage, um, and patients have about a 10 or so percent risk of, of having a radiation-induced complication that's symptomatic, and 4% of these complications are permanent. Negative predictors, obviously, large AVMs. It's, there's no science to that. <clears throat> Interestingly enough, unruptured AVMs fared worse than ruptured AVMs and prior embolization uh, of the AVM resulted in worse outcomes. And I'll get to that in a little bit. And in a pediatric series, the same kind of thing is found. Single session radiosurgery for very challenging AVMs. Uh, this is a sm much smaller series, but these are you know, rarer problems. Uh, favorable outcomes in only a third of patients. And you can see actuarial obliteration rates with single session, 35% at 10 years. Um, Post-radiation hemorrhage risk of 3% per year, and you can see there's still symptomatic and permanent radiation-induced changes. Obliteration was better in older uh, kids, and again, in previously ruptured AVM, so that goes across, uh, you know, the spectrum. <clears throat> so how do we do it, and when do we consider, um, you know, managing these patients? When do you do single-session radiosurgery, and how do you make radiosurgery better? So one of the possibilities is to stage your treatment approach. And I'll tell you what we do is we do volume staging, so we treat the patients over uh, different sessions. Um, and uh, in general, the way that we've done this is if, if the volume of the AVM is less than 10 cc's and, and we opt for radiosurgery, that we'll treat that in a single session. When it becomes kind of a borderline thing, we'll decide based on, uh, you know, uh, considerations of patient age and the nature of the AVM, its location and such. Um, and then if it's greater than 15 cc's, we generally volume stage. Um, we try to get you know, if it's a 20 cc AVM, we, try to, we generally try to split it in half, so two 10 cc treatments, or if it's 15, you know, two seven and a half cc treatments. And you may have to do more stages because it just may be too big to treat in, a, in, in two stages. So what are the, the two approaches? So you can take a volume stage approach, which is what most people honestly do. It's uh, especially with, with uh, gamma knife devices, um, the volume stage approach, basically what you want to do is split it up into a couple of equal volumes. Um, and the way you do this on the planning software is you plan the whole thing and then you cut back to half and you discern the volume. Um, and so it's very, very straightforward. You want to make sure that you give sufficient dose. I can't emphasize this enough. If you're going to treat AVMs with radiosurgery, don't bother giving less than 16 gray. It's not going to work. There's no point in doing it and it wastes the patient's time. <clears throat> so there's a dose staging technique. And that dose staging technique is basically fractionated radiosurgery or fractionated radiation therapy. Um, and this, in this technique, you treat the entire volume of the AVM um, with, uh, at various points. Um, but, you know, to be honest, the, the, the dosing of this, the fractionation schemes and stuff have not been uh, excellently worked out. And I think that's the less favorable of the two techniques, but, but it's, it's out there. So here's an example of volume staging. So we have a patient um, <clears throat> with, a, with a larger AVM. And, you know, we treat it with a uh, first stage. We um, generally, we don't get a second um, uh, angiogram in these cases. So we'll just treat them in the second stage uh, with their MRI scan. 
And this is an example, the first stage uh, volume with the angiogram, and then 40 months later, this patient uh, was fortunate to have a successful obliteration of their ABM. <clears throat> so in a systematic literature view, this has been looked at. So what's the best way to try to improve radiosurgery? Single session is maybe not the best way to do this. So let's look at what people have done for volume staging and dose staging. And there are about mm, you know, 500 patients or so here with larger AVMs, and essentially what they found is that it looks like volume staging probably works better, okay, because you're, you're giving bigger, bigger uh, single session doses, obliteration rates are higher, they're still not amazing. Um, symptomatic radiation complications are about 13%, but post-SRS bleeds are about 20%. Dose staging, uh, obliteration that's similar to single session uh, radiosurgery, um, and you see the complication rates. Now, with dose staging, the time to um, obliteration was better, um, but uh, the obliteration rate was much lower. So it looks like, in general, if you're going to do this, you might make the argument to volume stage that it improves obliteration rates, but the risks uh, are probably higher. One of the challenges in this field, because the numbers are so, so low, it's going to be exquisitely hard to compare treatments in a prospective, randomized way. It's just not going to happen. Um, these need to be prospective registries with at, at high volume centers who have multidisciplinary teams working on these problems. <clears throat> Some, someone could make the hypothesis here, and, and this has not been done, to kind of volume and dose stage at the same time. That might be an interesting thing where you increase obliteration rates, get faster obliterations with lower complications. So <clears throat> for many of the folks who do endovascular work here, I do not. Uh, but. This is a, a, an important statement when you're treating with radiosurgery. So I think as was very nicely pointed out, embolization for surgical management or to aid in surgical management of, of AVMs has a very specific goal. It's to help the surgeon treat the AVM. So you take the hardest parts of the AVM and you treat them endovascularly and the surgeon gets the other stuff that's easy to get on the way in. <clears throat> it's a different story. You know, the thought with, with uh, embolization in radiosurgery was we're going to make radiosurgery better and easier. We can shrink the volume of the AVM so you can give a higher dose. That is reproducibly and repeatedly been shown not to be effective. It does not improve radiosurgery. Pre-radiosurgical em, pre embolization. And that's because probably when you put all this tantalum and, and there are all these artifacts, you can't see the AVM anymore. So you don't know if you're treating the entire nidus appropriately. It may recanalize. We know that that certainly happens with endovascular techniques. And so you recanalize a part that you've embolized, but you shrunk down your radiosurgery treatment volume. You missed the thing that's now recanalized. Okay? And then maybe as a result of these things, maybe these embolized AVMs are much larger than we think they are. Okay? So you're probably reducing, um, you know, you're probably not taking as much as you think you're taking. <clears throat> And this is, these are our data, okay? So it's clear, I don't think that, you know, we have to beat a dead horse here. Pre-radiosurgical pre embolization does not make radiosurgery better. I would argue you should, not, you should not be doing it. Now, that doesn't mean you can't do it, and that doesn't mean there isn't a role in the management of these things. So what are the roles? Well, we already mentioned that you want to embolize things with microsurgery to make microsurgery safer and better for the patient. You know, some people still talk about embolizing these larger um, AVMs, but maybe you should do it after you do radiosurgery. So then you're still treating everything and you know where everything is, but maybe after doing that. And that hasn't been looked at. There are no prospective work when you embolize and you decrease the volume and flow after radiosurgery, okay? This is the key part here, is embolizing aneurysms, other vascular malformations that are associated with these AVMs. There, uh, uh, there are very good data to show um, that, that AVMs that have associated flow-related or intranidal aneurysms have a much higher risk of subsequent hemorrhage. So that's a very reasonable thing to safely treat in these patients to reduce subsequent hemorrhage risk. And I won't talk about the last one here. And these are, these are uh, you know, these data. So prenidal aneurysms, intranidal aneurysms, when you don't have an aneurysm, your risk of, of hemorrhage is low in, in our radiosurgical series. When you have an intranidal aneurysm, it's high, so treat those. That's a totally reasonable thing. Now, do you always have to? This is an interesting case. Of a, of a patient treated with uh, radiosurgery who had a um, carotid terminus uh, aneurysm. The AVM was obliterated. The aneurysm actually went away, okay? But I think it's a very reasonable and appropriate thing to treat uh, aneurysms associated with AVMs. So the last couple of, of things I'll mention. Can we make radiosurgery better? I mean, I, I haven't given you the stellar results of radiosurgery. No one's saying that with these types of things, as with surgery and as with embolization, that, that 
Um, we're, we're curing 100% of these with no complication rates. It's just not possible. Well, Pan and Taipei in the early 2000s proposed that you know, maybe we should be maybe we should be planning these differently. Maybe we need to make sure that we get as much dose in the nidus of these uh, as possible um, to to be able to uh, obliterate the AVM. Okay, so basically, what what our group did is we took that hypothesis. That is, if we changed the planning, or if we look back at at cases where we had planned and given a higher dose uh, to the nidus. Um, could, regardless of what the, the margin dose, so if the margin dose was the same, do patients have better outcomes? And could you obliterate these better? And basically what we showed is that if you got to getting a little more than 60% of the nidus receiving at least 20 gray, that obliteration rates were much higher. Okay? So how do we do this? Well, when you plan in radiosurgery, you know, there are a variety of ways to plan, and this is, people poo-poo radiosurgery all the time, especially my surgery colleagues. I do a lot of open surgery as well, but people say, that's not really surgery. It really doesn't take a brain to do that. You just push the button. Well, I would say that's not the case. I think that it's very nuanced, and it takes experts to do this. You can't just be messing around. You're, you know, you're, you do a little bit of radiosurgery on the side. I would argue if you want to do it right, you should do it with with some intention and, and uh, have some experience. If you train, change your treatment paradigm where you add a bunch of small isocenters to low, low weighted isocenters to the middle of the treatment volume, you can increase the percentage of the nidus that receives 20 gray. Okay? So this takes some thought. You don't just slap down isocenters. You don't just reverse dose plan. That's one of the benefits of, of radio surgery with a gamma knife is direct dose planning to be able to think about this problem. So I'll just mention one last technique and that is, that is um, doing radiosurgery maybe is a precursor to surgery. Neoadjuvant management of AVMs, you can get them to shrink down and then they become a surgical target. So this is uh, Dee Bablas, who a, was a, a colleague of mine um, at, at Pitt Med back in the day, um, looked at a, a handful of patients with, with challenging AVMs um, who had underwent volume stage radiosurgery and then they subsequently evaluated, you know, what happened, you know, these were not completely obliterated, but got surgically downgraded and made them surgically accessible and able to treat, okay? But what they did find is that Spetzler-Martin grading does not accurately measure the risk. It's probably intermediary. So you downgrade things, but after radiosurgery, it's not quite as downgraded as a, a natural grade two or a natural grade three. But this is a strategy that can certainly be used. You have a challenging AVM, especially if it re-ruptures. You've done radiosurgery. They're a candidate now. Maybe it's easier for the surgeon to get in there and to treat this. So what is the optimal radiosurgical strategy for high-grade AVMs? Well, I'll go back just briefly and say it has to be a, a multidisciplinary strategy with your endovascular colleagues, with your surgeons, to make sure you're doing the right thing. And if, treat, if treating them is not the right thing, then it's okay not to do that. When you do radiosurgery, you want conformal selective planning. As with everything, you want to increase dose fall off, decrease the risk to adjacent structures. Maybe volume staging is the best thing, and maybe a combination of volume and dose staging together might be an interesting thing to look at. You have to treat with at least a minimal margin dose of 17 gray. Um, you want to increase the volume of the AVM that receives 20 gray. Um, you treat endovascularly when you have aneurysms, not to reduce the size of the, of the lesion pre-radio surgery. And it's possible that radiosurgical downgrading may be beneficial to very highly selected patients who have very challenging AVMs. Thank you very much.